thank you for the invitation to talk today about Larry and about the start of his and all AIDS activism, which began in the spring or really the summer of 1981. I'm really grateful to the Beinecke. Uh, you, you said that I spent a lot of time there and I've been grateful for that time going through Larry's papers. As you know, and as many at the Beinecke know, since they've had to deliver and take away these boxes for me, Larry saved everything and it's a vast collection. And I thank God and I thank Larry that he did save everything because now the Beinecke has it all. Uh, I've joked to friends and maybe I joke to you, Michael, that I know that Larry bought an electric pencil sharpener in spring 1974, not long after he moved to his apartment at 2 Fifth Avenue, the apartment where in the summer of 1981, he hosts the first information session about Kaposi's sarcoma and the gay men who are mysteriously becoming sick with it or have already died. Because Larry saved and the Beinecke has the receipt of the electric pencil sharpener, the user's manual, and also a copy of the warranty. So I, I don't think that that level of detail or the pencil sharpener will make it into the biography that I'm writing. But what Larry has saved and the Beinecke has makes it possible to write Larry by Larry, excuse me, Larry's biography in the first place. The Beinecke has Larry's date books back to at least 1960. Kramer family papers, his letters. He was a brilliant letter writer and uh, luckily he had many friends in London and across the country. So he wrote a lot of letters. You have his drafts, his intermittent diaries. All of this is at the Beinecke and will help me as a biographer to establish both a chronology. I mean, so many details. I know that as I posted on Instagram a few weeks ago, he was at uh, Judy at Carnegie Hall on April 23rd, 1961. So that was a highlight when I found that. And I hope I'll be able to give a sense of Larry's personality, his character, his motivations, and his achievements. So one of the provocations for today's talk is that this week marks the 40th anniversary of the publication in the New York Native of the very first article about the disease that became known as AIDS. This appeared on May 18th, 1981, and it was written by Lawrence Mass, MD, who, and I hope this doesn't sound too romper room-ish, I believe he is in our virtual audience today, so I'd like to say I, I can see uh, Larry Mass. Uh, so in talking today about what Larry Kramer was doing in 1981, I want to acknowledge the other Larry's presence here today, Larry Mass, and acknowledge what he did and wrote in 1981 too. Larry Mass and Larry Kramer, by the way, first met in London in June 1969, coincidentally the week before Stonewall, when they were put in touch by a mutual friend because Larry Mass, then 23, was visiting London, and Larry Kramer was about to turn 34. He was living there, as he did until November 1970. So in Larry Mass's journal, which I regret to say is not at the Beinecke, but at the New York Public Library, another place I've done a lot of research, uh, he wrote in his journal, Larry Kramer came by around 9.30 p.m. This was on Larry Mass's uh, second day in London. He seems pleasant. We went to some pub in Chelsea before going on to a party. Afterwards, we went to some gay discotheque bar private club. Very unattractive, more or less boring, the, the place. Absurdly expensive. Larry dropped me off around 1 a.m. Larry has just finished producing D.H. Lawrence's Women in Love with Alan Bates and Oliver Reed. Sounds so good. So this is the 40th anniversary, as I say, of Larry Mass's article, and that's one provocation. But today I want to also note that it's very close to another sad milestone, which is that next week will mark the first anniversary of Larry Kramer's death on May 27th of last year. So I'm speaking today in commemoration of that anniversary as well. In the winter and spring of 1981, Larry Kramer was working with less confidence than he felt comfortable about on a novel. Faggots, his first novel, had been published just over two years before in November 1978, and he was excuse me, and he was also trying to make some money at screenwriting. He kept in touch with friends in the movie business, suggesting ideas, putting himself forward for screenwriting work, both in London and in Hollywood. He thought of directing a movie, possibly of an original screenplay of his own, though in May 1981, as a letter at the Beinecke documents, Andrew Holleran, 
makes the playful suggestion that Larry should direct a movie of Dancer from the Dance. Uh, and at this time, Larry is also writing more of that second novel. Ultimately in late spring, he has about 300 pages he wants to show to friends. But he's still having a sort of midlife, uh, I'm not sure if the word is crisis, ennui, thinking through things. He wrote to one friend at the end of March, 1981, where am I? I wish I knew, or maybe it's time to realize that one never knows. I write every day on this new novel. All I know is that I'm not terribly happy at present, and whether it's the book or the life or both, who knows? It's a particularly detailed and intimate letter. He and the friend to whom he's been writing, or excuse me, he and the friend to whom he is writing had been in group therapy together. And Larry at 45 is trying to sort out how much of what he's feeling is unique to him and how much is part of a certain kind of expected thing to happen to him in midlife. Suddenly, he writes, I'm frightened of all sorts of things, metaphorically refusing to fly with life and self. This has happened before, and it usually presages some sort of leap forward growth. And all I can say is I'm waiting for whatever. Funnily enough, I can't say that I'm unhappy. Something will happen. We'll get through it. I'll take off the 10 pounds that I've put back on yet again. I've been seeing sort of, not really, a couple of guys who are brighter than my usual, but not by enough. It all sounds like I'm ready for a big change, doesn't it? Something will happen. Larry wrote this on March 31st, six weeks before Larry Mass's native article. He was, of course, unaware of what was already happening, what was already spreading in terms of what would later be identified as AIDS. But he himself was just getting over a severe case of amoebas, not his first and itself an epidemic among urban gay men in particular in the 1970s and early 1980s. He had a premonition added to by the sadness and anxiety he felt about a friend in San Francisco with whom he'd had a brief affair, who at 29 had Hodgkins. In the first half of 1981, they are exchanging letters about this friend's treatment and fears of death. This friend, so young, is so ill, though his friend, Frank, is often hopeful and helpful to Larry in turn. You say it's a bummer period for you. I wish I could help to restore your temporarily misplaced self-confidence. I love that phrase. You're a talented and very considerate man. Any harm in giving yourself the credit you deserve, Frank wrote. Just finished with the debilitating amoebas, Frank, uh, Larry hopes it's for the last time, um, and with his friend's cancer on his mind, in that March 31st letter, he's philosophical and fearful and wondering, as he did in Faggots, about what his sex life means to him and what gay men are or could be doing to themselves, what the psychological and physical costs might be. It's shocking to me, he says in this letter, to think that almost a year of my life has been thrown away just because of some damn sexually transmitted bug. I won't, can't go to the baths anymore because that's where they are most rampant. Some guys never get them and they greet me upon entering. And I won't fuck with anybody until I practically give them questionnaires to fill out on their health. And everybody has a more grisly story than the last person. So whether this means that promiscuity is out for the 80s or whether it just means it's out for Larry, I don't know. One does need a calling, I fear, and it's very hard for the Jew in me not to be possessed by one. Or maybe I'm just relaxing into middle age. Yuck. So this is Larry at the end of March 1981 writing to his friend Phil, now in New Mexico. This is his life as he's trying to figure out and New York gay life, how he's going to figure that out. That phrase, though, whether this means promiscuity is out for the 80s or whether it just means it's out for Larry, there's so much in it because I love that he's wondering, of course, about whether promiscuity will be passe for the 80s. But reading it, as I did in the Beinecke so many years later, I also took it another way that promiscuity was out for the 80s and that it devoured the decade and killed so many. Near the end of this letter, Larry passes on some news of mutual friends, not knowing that it is linked to the questions about promiscuity and his need for a calling that he's just been wondering about.
Paul Popham looks just the same. Two of his Fire Island housemates died. One, a school teacher from cancer and Nick Rock from nobody knows what, a most peculiar long, slow disintegration that no hospital could discover why about. Paul Popham with Larry and also Larry Mass would be among the founders of GMHC in January, 1982, and Paul would become the group's president. The school teacher was named Rick Welikoff. Two years later, in March, 1983, Larry published 1112 and counting in the New York native. The article ends with a list of 20 dead men Larry knew. Nick, at Nick Rock and Rick Welikoff are the first two names on that list. So this is Larry that spring with all sorts of premonitory anxiety about his own life and about the life and sex life of the gay community. But in that spring of 1981, even the books he's reading seem to have an accidental importance. Writing to his friend in New Mexico, he says, yes, I do worry about you. I tend to worry generally way too much, but particularly about people I like and feel in some way close to. I think I got that from my mother, who was a social worker for the Red Cross and tended to be taking care of our entire world at one time or another. Or to quote from a passage I have just read in a book which I am quite enjoying, Other People's Worlds by William Trevor, Julia's tendency was to find herself haunted by plights that were not her own. Her own she could somehow cope with. So Larry Mass's article appeared in May 1981. The New York Times article, Rare Cancer Seen in 41 Homosexuals, appeared on Friday, July 3rd on page A20. This galvanized Larry and others, as did Larry Mass's continuing and expanded coverage in the New York native, including a front page article, Cancer in the Gay Community, that ran to four pages in the last issue of July, and then two articles, including KS, latest developments, in the issue dated August 24th to September 6th. Larry's first article for The Native appeared alongside Larry Mass's two pieces and was titled, A Personal Appeal from Larry Kramer. This is not as famous a piece as 1112 and counting, which would appear in The Native 18 months later, but as different as it is from that later piece in tone and rhetoric and in its ideas for urgent action, and what it suggested was immediately necessary to do, it is equally revelatory of Larry and how at this earliest stage of the epidemic, he understood it, grasped its scope, its scale, and what it meant and for gay men who in those early months seemed almost uniquely to have the disease. 1112 and counting begins, if this article doesn't scare the shit out of you, we're in real trouble. If this article doesn't rouse you to anger, fury, rage, and action, gay men may have no future on this earth. Our continued existence depends on just how angry you can get. But in summer 1981, Larry did not yet see a cause for anger, though he was no less urgent than he would be 18 months later, that action must be taken and that gay men must take action for themselves. It's difficult to write this without sounding alarmist or too emotional or just plain scared, he began in a personal appeal. The number of cases was rising precipitously and unendingly. 40 men a month before, 80 the week before he wrote this piece. Today, I must tell you, he wrote that 120 gay men in the United States, most of them here in New York, um, have died. Oh, sorry, I skipped a line. Uh, today, I must tell you that 120 gay men in the United States, most of them here in New York, are suffering from a lethal form of cancer called Kaposi's sarcoma or from a virulent form of pneumonia that may be associated with it. More than 30 have died. By the time you read this, the necessary figures may be much higher. Larry wanted to raise awareness of the disease, but now primarily he was aiming to raise money for research at the New York University Medical Center, where the majority of Kaposi cases are being tended to, he wrote. The doctor, quote, most on top of this situation is there. This was Dr. Alvin Friedman Keene, who would be the speaker at an information session that Larry hosted at his two Fifth Avenue apartment at about the same time this article appeared. Money is desperately needed, Larry wrote, for research and also for the treatment many of the patients 
now have no money or medical insurance. So his personal appeal was for money. I hope you will write a check and get your friends to write one too. This is our disease and we must take care of each other and ourselves. In the past, we have often been a divided community. I hope we can all get together on this emergency, undivided, cohesively, and with all the numbers we in so many ways possess. Larry's personal appeal was helpful in terms of money raised, very. The meeting at Larry's apartment was also extremely successful at this. About 80 people came and $4,605 was raised. Whether because of the meeting or the article, by September 1st, another $2,030 came in. Larry brought money to NYU every two weeks. On September 14th, after fundraising in Fire Island, another $2,168.55 came in. I love the 55 cents. Larry keeps very careful records uh, through 1981 uh, into January of 1982 about each uh, tranche of money and how much it is. And it's just on an index card uh, with his notation. And then he brings it over uh, to NYU Medical Center uh, in person. So some of the, this is the result, as I say, of canvassing on Fire Island. And then near the end of September, another $2,553 uh, comes in. So by the end of October, 11,000, 11, uh, I wish it was 11,000, $11,806.55 had been raised. But its effectiveness was not, and not surprisingly, by nature limited and only short term, at least in terms of the money that was sent to Larry's apartment, because he had given the address uh, to send uh, the money to in, at the bottom of his personal appeal. Another $40 comes in in December, and on January 8th, when Larry has the meeting that week uh, with Larry Kramer, Larry Mass, Paul Popham, Paul Rappaport and Nathan Fain and Edmund White, they, they found gay men's health crisis. There was another $150 to be delivered. But Larry's call to action was one thing. His take on what was causing the outbreak and the spread was for many, another thing entirely. Larry had written in his piece, we have often been in divided community and he hoped we can all get together on this emergency undivided cohesively, as I said, but that was not to be. His first disappointment was that when direct appeal was made to gay men beyond those he and his friends knew to invite to his apartment, the results were uninspiring. In the first enthusiasm for action by those who had met in Larry's apartment, they planned fundraising on Fire Island. Thousands of copies of a six page brochure, including Larry Mass's native article, Cancer in the Gay Community, were distributed to every house on Fire Island in the Pines and in Cherry Grove over Labor Day weekend. And this along with booths in the harbors of both communities and soliciting in front of the Ice Palace Disco on the Saturday night, all of this raised only $769.55, which is where that odd 55 cents comes from, of which only $126 was raised at the Ice Palace. This was a shameful amount, Larry felt shameful and worse, he thought, and a figure he would never forget. The pathetic $126, the consequence and the symbol for Larry of a hideous and self-destructive apathy as he saw it, and which 18 months later was one of the underpinnings of the rage in 1112 and counting. In those 18 months, there was great success too in raising awareness. GMHC was founded and it had fundraising of excuse me, it had fundraising success of its own, bringing Larry often a sense of the community at work, the community coming together. And Larry had a large share in that success, both in the planning and the execution of it, and in the joy of camaraderie amidst fear and death that it brought him and others. By August 9th, 1982, one year after that meeting in Larry's apartment, GMHC research disbursements made included $20,000 to St. Luke's Roosevelt and $5,250 to Memorial Sloan Kettering, another $5,250 to Mount Sinai Medical Center, and $886 to Ginny Lemon and Noreen Russell, two psychiatric social workers who co-led KS support groups. For the moment and for this talk, I will have to leave aside the negligence non-response of the city and its lack of money for AIDS. 
But his 18, 1981, August 1981 analysis of the spread of the disease when so little was known, many did not agree with his diagnosis of what was causing this outbreak of Kaposi sarcoma and pneumonia. As one of the people I've interviewed said to me, speaking about Larry in general, and not about this article in particular, Larry was right even when he was wrong on the day. And many people felt Larry was wrong in that personal appeal and that it was objectionable and worse when he wrote, the men who have been stricken don't appear to have done anything that many New York gay men haven't done at one time or another. We're appalled by this, that this is happening to them and terrified that it could happen to us. It's easy to become frightened that one of the many things we've done or taken from a tiny something or other that got in there who knows when from doing who knows what. Yet this was really notably careful. The men don't appear to have done. It's easy to become frightened that one of the many things we've done. None of this is any more definitive than that, though the wording was also vetted, excuse me, vetted by Larry Mass and Dr. Friedman Kine. Many rejected this analysis, which is phrased deliberately as more of a possible scenario or a hunch. Many rejected this outright, and in a sense, the very title of Larry's fundraising appeal invited unknowingly this reaction. Larry's personal appeal had the unintended consequence of inviting outrage from those who did not feel Larry had much personal appeal at all, not in particular as the author of Faggots. In many ways, that novel, or the, many, the way many had read it, made Larry's suggestion of what it might be that was behind the outbreak sound more definitive and damning to gay men than he intended or than it was. Hadn't Larry and Faggots had his doppelganger Fred Lemish say, why do faggots have to fuck so fucking much? It's as if we don't have anything else to do. All we do is live in our ghetto and dance and drug and fuck. There's a whole world out there as much ours as theirs. But if Larry was questioning how much of gay life was structured around sex, and if that meant a lot of people rejected his interpretation as, in a way, anti-liberationist, it is important to see that he was also making a political statement that the gay community should not be marginalized or allow itself to be marginalized, or perhaps worst of all, marginalize itself. To remember that his quote, anti-sex in, in that rant, that anti-sex rant that some felt it to be in faggots, though I don't think it is that, ends with the reminder, the world is as much ours as theirs. Much of this disagreement about Larry's personal appeal played out in the pages of the native. Writers, the most prominent of them, the playwright Robert Chesley, and readers of The Native and of Faggots objected to Larry's piece as a kind of sequel to what they hated most and thought most reactionary and even ridiculous about faggots. As Chesley put it in his letter to The Native, read anything by Kramer closely. I think you'll find the subtext is always the wages of sin are death. Chesley's was not the lone voice. There would be more attacks in subsequent natives and over many more years of fighting. Larry's reply ran in the natives last issue of 1981. I am not interested in sin, he wrote. I am interested in the difficulties people have in loving each other. I am also interested in how we use sex as a weapon. And I think anyone will find that all of my writing, including my film adaptation of Women in Love, concerns itself with explorations of these subjects, which have nothing to do with the wages of sin or death. The consequences of this disagreement would play out for many years and is beyond the scope or the time limit of this talk today. But what Larry called Robert Chesley's suggestion that among many other things, he was, quote, self-righteously thrilled by the death of my gay friends from Kaposi sarcoma, even as I appeal for funds to fight it, outraged Larry. That's how Larry put what Robert Chesley was saying, and gave Larry both a provocation and also an incentive to sharpen and extend his argument and also to expand upon and heighten the range of his rhetoric as did the rising number of deaths, still then so minimal compared to what soon would come and would continue. 
something we are doing is ticking off the time bomb that is causing the breakdown of the immunity in certain bodies, Larry wrote, coordinating his information again. His informor, excuse me, his coordinating his information, what really is just an informative surmise in a way, with Dr. Friedman Kine and others. And while it is true that we don't know what it is specifically, isn't it better to be cautious until various suspected causes have been discounted rather than be reckless? An individual can choose to continue or cease smoking where the warnings have been presented, pointed out to us and questioned by many. But isn't it stupid to rail against the very presentation of these warnings? That was Larry at the end of 1981. In early January, 1982, as I've said, GMHC was founded. But I want to close with some last words about Larry in the summer and fall of 1981. In August, just as a personal appeal was to be published and as he was getting ready for a vacation in Nantucket, he wrote to a friend in London about how surprisingly his summer had unfolded, which made the week he was planning even more necessary than when he started. I have been very involved quite suddenly and unexpectedly in fundraising, he wrote. A strange and virulent and deadly cancer epidemic has suddenly come out of nowhere to strike gay men only from 40 to 80 to 120 cases since May. And the NYU Medical Center made an urgent appeal to the gay community to raise funds for treatment of a lot of the guys who could not afford the chemotherapy without which death comes in a matter of months. So producer Larry, with what someone described as my outstanding skills as orchestration, this was Nathan Fain, who would be one of the GMHC co-founders. So producer Larry has been very busy organizing fundraisers and solicitations on Fire Island and a big benefit dance. The whole thing has been horrifying, not only because of the cancer, which is certainly very mysterious and frightening, frightening but also because of all the rest of the politics, cancer, hospitals, doctors, frightened homosexual community, et cetera, et cetera. Never again will I look upon doctors as Aerosmiths or as in the Citadel or not as a stranger, saving humanity on white chargers. Now, all they want is the Nobel Prize. Aside from that, all is good. I'm in good health and mind and I'm writing away on certain other projects. What Nathan Fain called orchestrating, Robert Chesley might have called terrorizing. But Larry was now thinking, I think, of the question raised by a gay friend of his in London to whom he had also written that summer and who wrote to Larry in September, hadn't heard of Kaposi's sarcoma, but it sounds very sinister and frightening. Wonder why it only hits gay men. That question remained. But I like to think that Larry at this earliest stage of the activism that would last until his death might have taken some pleasure from a letter he received when he sent his mother, the social worker for the Red Cross who tended to be taking care of the entire world at one time or another, the issue of the native with his personal appeal in it. The open letter she wrote was terrific. You are a writer and that's in all capitals and you told it all succinctly and beautifully expressed. That word, writer, and that work meant the most to him of all.